I, th I think it's really clear to see that our, our schools and our other basic institutions are under attack right now, and that that is really threatening you know, the ability for you know, regular people, students, workers, and just parents, just all of us in reality, to just really get ahead. But I want to invite you guys to actually watch some clips that show just how long this attack has been going on, um, how it's playing out in different parts of the country, and just where this is going. In Chicago, there's a housing project, Oakdale Gardens, far, far, far south side of Chicago. It's the most isolated part of Chicago, and they opened up a charter school, a corporate charter chain. The charter school chain contracted with an education management organization, EMO, Edison Learning. Edison Learning, if I'm not mistaken, when it used to be Edison Schools, got kicked out of Philadelphia schools. Liberty Partners bought Edison Schools, rebranded it as Edison Learning, gave it a Nike-like swoosh logo, and sent it back out there as one of their entities that they could then pitch to investors all over the planet as a place of a, a profitable uh, enterprise in which to invest. So here you have a situation where Edison Learning is in a new charter school in Oakdale Gardens and the projects in Chicago. And they have investors in, pick your favorite city, Sao Paulo, Paris, London, Tokyo, or wherever, investing into Liberty Partners, and they are making profit off of the education that is being given, and I say given because it's not coming from the community, to the students in Oakdale Gardens in Chicago. So you have global education processes playing out. What does that mean? It means they cut corners everywhere they can because Edison Schools, Edison Learning, has 490,000 students in its schools between the US and in England. And they can only need to make a small profit margin from each one of those students to be able to accumulate, like Walmart, good profits so that those transnational investors in Singapore, London, Tokyo, or Paris will make profit off the education from all Gale Gardens. That's how we have to think about what's happening in our schools and in our communities. We have to make these connections and understand the global processes. School transformation in DC has, has, uh, has meant one or two things. Schools are being either transformed into charters or they're being transformed into condos. And one particular school that that we worked in Anacostia, it was a public school um, in what we call East of the River, that's the black poor neighborhood with the majority youth population um, that have been a uh, site of you know, violence, community turnover and stuff like that. It's also a place now where there's this, uh, this Hope Six initiative. I don't know if this happened in other schools, but all the surrounding housing projects that young people came from, they started getting shut down and they started pushing young people out of their communities. And now we see it in Anacostia, as Anacostia prepares to enter a school modernization. Barry Farms, which is the oldest and probably the first public housing uh, space in the country, is now being closed. And so we always, so we begin to ask ourselves kind of who's gonna, gonna inherit these schools as the communities that these young people coming from are now being disrupted and moved out. And, and again, they're being transformed into condos. And so, we see a very uh, close trend in DC between kind of school transformation and community transformation where people are being pushed out of schools, schools are being remade and then reopened, and then the, the young people who fought for them, the families who, who went to these crappy schools for all these years are no longer in the space to, to benefit from it. The first thing that happened was our governor, he was cutting education, and our governor is our former mayor of, our, of the city of Baltimore, so him cutting education was a slap in the face knowing that the, the um, injustices that we were already facing of the state had already been systematically underfunding the Baltimore public school system. Um, then afterwards he announced that there was he was putting money in a budget to build new prisons. He also said at a press conference that superintendents should save money by buying prison made furniture. So that was the statement that got students riled up. That direct link saying that superintendents so schools could save money if they purchased prison made furniture. And it was just an insult to students um, around the city. So we organized, we had a march on uh, March 4th. 
we met the Philadelphia um, Union through the Alliance for Educational Justice, so they're part of that big alliance. And we understand that what's going here, going on in Baltimore, that's not the only place it's going on. It's going on here in Philly. It's going on in New York. They're trying to also stop the school to prison pipeline, so it only makes sense for us to come down and to work with the people in Philly um, in solidarity to end the school to prison pipeline because it doesn't take just one person or just one movement or just one organization. We understand that we have to get to together and fight back against the bosses and we have to do that with the power of the people and the young people coming together and saying no we we won't take this so that's why we came down we support the philadelphia student union and their fight to end the school to prison pipeline we can see that states would rather build prisons instead of funding our schools this is a national crisis that we can't and will not run from It's evident from what we just watched that politics play a heavy part in our education. And for some, there's an interest that see a profit-making source. That makes me wonder, like, why I always keep hearing, like, it's just not enough funding to go around. So I'm going to ask you guys, why are schools really being underfunded? Um, uh, it's an attack on poor people because mm -hmm. when you think about it, I feel as though what people are expecting of me as a student is I I'm either, I'll either have two choices. I should drop out or I should go to jail because that's the only way I'm gonna be worth anything to them because if I drop out, okay, then I'll work for you for a lot cheaper and if I go to jail, then I'm basically a slave and you don't have to pay um, for me to you know, do the labor and make product. Mm -hmm. I think that was really well said, Azim. And also, um, I think that the trend in education is similar to the trends across all the sectors over the last 30 years, which is to um, try to reframe just our whole um, society mm -hmm. around the idea that we just don't really have any basic human rights, right? We don't have the right to education. Yeah. We don't have the right to work at a living wage. We don't have the right to health care. We don't have mm -hmm. the right to anything. So I think that the attacks on public education are similar um, and go hand in hand with the attacks on the idea that we have basic human rights. Mm -hmm. um, so. All right. And I think one of the reasons why they blame um, why they give themselves a reason to attack us is part of that um, stereotype, well, you belong in prison because you're violent, not, not uh, you're violent because you're in a violent situation. So that's why we do the work that we do mm. with the Campaign for Nonviolent Schools is to um, end that stereotype. There's a tremendous amount of potential and hope mm -hmm. in this idea of parents, students, workers, and educators really getting together because we do form the basis of um, a pretty broad social movement if mm -hmm. we if we um, become conscious of, of that power. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the increasing um, stratification and the disparity between wealth and poverty in the country is being played out in many ways inside our education system. You know, we often look to our local leaders or even our local politicians around what's happening in our schools. And I think that in terms of the overall program, for public education, we need to be looking at the Walton Family Foundation. We need to be looking at the Broad Superintendents Academy. It's something that people should look at. Where's the money really flowing that's behind the, the overall program? Which I think the program is, is for, for many is, who, are, who are funding it and who are behind it, is taking us back to a time when you could potentially only access education if you have the money to pay for it. Mm. Um, so I actually, you know, there are folks out there that want to roll back the whole idea of universal public education that's free.